Welcome to Tax Law GH and welcome to our session on capital allowances. This is similar to employment income, another favorite topic for examiners. Um, it's certain, almost certain to feature in every single tax paper in one way or the other. So you need to know capital allowance if you want to stand a chance of passing any tax exam that does test some bit of direct tax or income taxes. What is capital allowances? Or what is capital allowance? Um, what does the law seek to tell us about capital allowance? We'll look at this from the perspective of the Income Tax Act of 2015, Act 896, and from the perspective of the Income Tax Regulations of 2016, LI 2244. So what does the law say about capital allowances? It's, it's provided that for the purposes of ascertaining the income of a person from a business, take note, you get capital allowances from or in ascertaining your business income. You cannot get capital allowances for employment income. You cannot get capital allowances for investment income. Take note, capital allowances are provided for the purpose of ascertaining business income for a year. And the law is saying that you are allowed some capital allowances. It said that a capital allowance is granted in respect of something called a depreciable asset, which number one must be owned first of all and used by a person during a year of assessment in the production of the income of that person from a business. So for you to get capital allowance, First of all, it must be on a depreciable asset, number one. Number two, it's you must exercise some form of ownership over that asset. And number three, you must actually use that asset to produce the income of your business. And the law says this will be computed in line with the provisions in the third schedule. The third shadow of Act 896 is what provides for capital allowances. The law is saying also that a person to whom capital allowance with respect to a particular year of assessment is granted shall take that capital allowance in that year and shall not defer that allowance. What this means technically is you cannot say, I am carrying forward my capital allowance, I'm not going to use it this year. But in practice, what is done is you can subsume your capital allowance as part of your losses and then carry these forward into subsequent um, periods. But the law is clear on this provision that you cannot defer capital allowances. You must take it this year, really. That's what it means. You cannot say, I won't take it this year, I'll take it in subsequent years. You cannot defer your capital allowance it's going strictly by the wording of the law. But in practice, um, capital allowances are lumped together, together with losses, and then carried forward um, into future periods. Before I even come into this, um, come to the issue of this classification of assets, let's look at some basic accounting, which I'm praying really hard you would have done something around that. If not, it's fine. There's a concept called depreciation in accounting. The concept of depreciation does one thing. It allocates the value of an asset over the useful life of an asset. What do I mean? When you have an asset, as you are using the asset, the asset loses value over time. So we can call that loss of value as a result of passage of time. Another factor of depreciation could be obsolescence. That asset may lose value because the asset becomes obsolete. Now, there are other factors of depreciation, but the whole idea of depreciation is to ensure that we charge an expense that will reflect the pattern of consumption of that asset. So if you have an asset, let's say you buy um, a car and that car is worth $50,000 and that car has a useful life of five years. What it means is if you are doing a straight line depreciation, which means an equal amount of depreciation every year, we expect 
that you would depreciate 10,000 every year until the fifth year. This is of course assuming that from an accounting perspective, there is no residual value or scrap value. Now let's come back to tax. What capital allowance seeks to do is kind of mirroring what accounting will do for depreciation. So those who are accountants, you probably know IA16 on property plant equipment, which provides for depreciation of tangible non-current assets. Capital allowance does something similar to depreciation, but in a different way. Whereas in accounting, accountants have some flexibility in determining their own accounting policy. In tax, the law has classified every asset and how it must be depreciated. In accounting, you can decide to use reducing balance for your computers, use straight line for your buildings, use straight line for your uh, motor vehicles. It's up to you, but tax, it is fixed. In tax, we have broken down the classes for capital allowance into five main classes. You need to know this. It will definitely be on your exam. You need to know this. So the first class is called class one or pool one. We call it a pool, P-O-O-L, because you bring all assets together into one big family, if you can call it. I can use that term, right? So class one contains all computers, and data handling equipment together with their peripheral devices. So computers, data handling equipment together with peripheral devices are class one assets. They are depreciated at a rate of 40% on a reducing balance basis. Take note that reducing balance basis, just a quick revision in case you've forgotten, is a method of depreciation where the amount to be depreciated is higher in the earlier years and reduces over the life of the asset. On the other hand, remember that straight line means that you depreciate a constant or a fixed amount over the useful life of the asset. So what the tax law says is for class one assets, which will be computers, data handling equipment together with all peripherals, we use a rate of 40% on a reducing balance basis. So examples would be your laptop, your um, modem, your keyboard, your uh, mouse, all computer peripherals, right, are class one assets. Any device that also handles data is a class one asset. So if you have a big um, router or a big server in your office that is used to handle data, transmit internet um, connectivity, it's a class one asset. Um, even to some extent, mobile phones are computers these days because the kind of phones we have, if you have an iPad, it's clearly a computer. The fact that it doesn't have a keyboard doesn't mean it's not a computer, right? Once it can process data, once it can handle data, um, it is a class one asset. Take note, 40% on a reducing balance basis. Class two contains automobiles, buses and minibuses, goods, vehicles, construction and earth moving equipment, heavy general purpose or specialized trucks, trailers and trailer mounted containers, plants and machinery used in manufacturing. It also includes assets which result from expenses in respect of long term crop planting costs, which I'll explain subsequently. Class 2 assets are depreciated or granted capital allowance at a rate of 30% on a reducing balance basis. Class 3 assets are railroad cars, locomotives and equipment, vessels, barges, tags, and similar water transport equipment, aircraft, specialized public utility plants, equipment and machinery, office furniture, fixtures and equipment, and any depreciable asset not included in another class, that will be 20% reducing balance. I'll show you an easy way to remember all of these classifications very soon. So stick with me. Class four contains buildings, structures, and similar works of a permanent nature that is 10% on a straight line basis. Take note, we've stopped reducing balance at this point. A straight line, which means equal amount 
every year. Class five is intangible assets. It's the assets you cannot see, touch, um, intangible assets really. They are divided by their useful life in the pool. So if it's an asset with a five year useful life, you divide the cost of the asset by five and essentially technically you end up being a variant of the straight line method. Now, if you want to remember this classification, class one is for computers and data and equipment and all their peripherals. If you watch the vehicles in class two, they are all road vehicles. Take note, class two contains road vehicles. In addition to road vehicles, you can see plant and machinery used in manufacturing. So in an exam question, usually the examiner will mention this in the preamble, in the body of the question or in the requirements. Once they mention a manufacturing company, all their plants, all their machinery in the factory will be class two assets. Take note, if the company is not a manufacturing company and let's say they are a retail business, then their machinery will be a class three asset, not class two. So take note for manufacturing companies, their plants, their machinery will be class two. In addition to this, road vehicles are class two. Then, like I said, I'll explain the um, long-term crop planting costs shortly. Now let's come to class three. Real road cars is not a road vehicle. So class three is for all other vehicles in quotes um, that are not on the road. Are not road vehicles. So look at the first one: railroad, locomotives and equipment, vessels, barges, tags. They are all on water. Aircraft is in the air, right? So every other means of transport that is not on the road is a class three asset. Class two is for the road ones. If you want to remember, just a quick summary, right? Then, apart from that, you can see we start mentioning general assets. So generalized or specialized public utility plants, equipment and machinery. So here, like I said, if it is not a manufacturing company then their plant and machine is class three if it's a manufacturing company their plant and machine will be class two remember this it's almost always tested then we see here that office furniture fixtures and equipment and interestingly it says over here any depreciable asset not included in that class so i always say if you are in an exam and you can't tell where to put the asset, put it in class three. Simple. If you are not sure where the asset you look, you've thought about everything possible. It doesn't look like class one, it doesn't look like class two. It surely is not class four or five. Put it in class three. Class three is for all other assets, unless otherwise stated. That's if you want to remember. Then class four is easy to remember buildings, structures, and similar works of a permanent nature. So this is where you put all your buildings and um, similar structures. Then class five is for all intangible assets. So your software, um, similar copyright, patent, all of those things, right? We'll go into class five. So remember the rates, if you want to remember, is four, three, two, one. You can see 40, 30, 20, 10. So just don't stress too much. Remember what goes into each um, class. Then you remember that, oh, from one to five is four, three, two, one, and then straight line. What do I mean by four, three, two, one? 40% reducing balance, 30 reducing balance, or they've come to 20 reducing balance, 10 straight line, then useful life. You still want to remember the difference between reducing balance and straight line. One, two, three, class one, two, and three are reducing balance, class four and five, straight line. So please remember this. You must know this. It will be on your exam for sure. Then let me explain the long term crop planting costs. So we see over here that unless otherwise provided, an expense referred to below shall be treated as if the expense was incurred in securing the acquisition of a depreciable asset that is used by the person in the production of income. So we are saying that the above applies to expenses incurred by a person wholly, exclusively, and necessarily in the production of the income of that person from a business in respect of planting vegetation from which timber, rubber, oil palm, or other crops are derived. And where the business is a timber concern or a large-scale rubber, oil palm, or other long-term crop plantation. So if you have a company 
that is into let's say oil palm plantation or a timber or rubber business any costs they incur will be deemed as if they were acquiring a depreciable asset and remember what did the table i showed you say it's supposed to be a class two asset so you put those in class two and they will attract a 30 percent capital allowance on a reducing balance basis then now that we know the five main classes for petroleum operations and mining and mineral operations they have their own system so for mining companies and petroleum companies you don't go about putting their assets in the general class one two three four five no separate petroleum operations have one pool for everything and the rate is 20 percent on a straight line basis mining companies also have the same as the petroleum guys 20 percent on a straight line basis take note these petroleum operations and mining operations have one pool for everything so they put their computers their everything into one pool they don't follow the general pool system where they have class one two three four five mining companies petroleum operations they pick all their assets and throw it into one pool and they do everything at 20 percent straight line so you see computer in there you see motor vehicle in there um, you see buildings in there you see software in there everything will be in there at 20 percent straight line remember this, this is a very key crucial thing to remember then let's look at some specifics around capital allowance which will be very important we are saying that class one two or three depreciable assets owned and employed by a person during a year of assessment in the production of income from a particular business shall at the time the asset is first owned and employed by that person be placed in a pool with all other assets of the same class owned and employed by that person in the business what this means is under the pooling system assets lose their individuality what do i mean if you buy a computer let's say you buy an hp then you buy the latest m1 macbook uh, released by apple in november of 2020 once they all enter the class one pool they've lost their identity we don't know which one is macbook again we don't know which one is um which other one did i mention the other laptop yeah so you put all your class one two three assets in one pool and they lose their identity same for class two pools you put motor vehicles in one pool and they all vanish they become one class two pool because don't forget you are doing reducing balance so they are mixed together and you are depreciating them together remember this class one two three depreciation basis will be on a reducing balance basis and then they will be on a pooling system and as such will lose their identity in the pool when we start doing the computational elements you will see this a lot more clearly with the numbers next is we are seeing a class 4 or a class 5 depreciable asset owned and employed by a person during a year shall at the time the asset is first owned and employed by the person be placed in a pool of its own watch this carefully in a pool of its own separately from other assets of that class or any other class what this means is that for class four and five assets they do not lose their individuality what it actually means is that for class four and class five you need to open sub lines or sub pools in that same main pool so for example if you have a building you don't put all your buildings in one class four pool and say they've lost their identity no you must track each building separately and grant capital allowance on a straight line basis separately and don't forget that straight line is granted on the initial cost so because of that you need to track every single figure let me give you an, an even interesting example if you have a building you are constructing and it's a three-story building and you finish the first floor so because of that you capitalize the first floor what the law requires is you put the first floor in a separate class 4 pool so you can call that class 4a year 2 you complete the second floor 
the law requires you to capitalize that one separately in a separate pool 4b or class 4b in the third year you do the third floor that goes into another separate class 4 pool called class 4c you don't mix class 4 and 5 assets together they maintain their individuality because they are not on the reducing balance basis number one and number two they are computed on their original cost so you must maintain that individuality the next is that where a depreciable asset owned by a person is partly used in the production of income from a business only that part used shall be placed in the pool of depreciable assets so let's say you have a motor vehicle that you use 80 percent of the time to do business um, errands 20 percent of the time use it to attend weddings and funerals and stuff what the law is saying is you will only apportion the part that is used for business which is 80 percent and you add that for capital allowance purposes in the class two pool for motor vehicles the 20 percent we will not grant you any capital allowance on it because you are using it for personal use so remember assets that are partly used for private purposes and partly used for business would have to be apportioned their cost will be apportioned before they are granted capital allowance then how do you compute capital allowance how is it done we know the rates we know class one two three will be on a reducing balance basis we know class 1, 2, 3 will be 40%, 30%, 20% respectively. We know class 4 is 10% on a straight line basis. We know class 5 is the asset cost divided by the useful life. So how do you compute capital allowance? We are saying here that with respect to each basis period of a person ending in the year of assessment, the commercial general shall grant an allowance to that person for a year of assessment for each pool of depreciable assets. The allowance referred to above shall be equal to the depreciation for the period of each pool of depreciable assets and computed in accordance with the rules below. First, depreciation for a year of assessment for the pool will be computed in the case of class 1, 2, and 3 using what? The reducing balance method. We've said this already. And in the case of class four and five, we use the straight line method. Very important to remember this. There's a formula to use to compute capital allowance. The formula you need to remember is A times B times C over 365. Remember, this is very important. Some students have an interesting way of um, treating some of these things. This is the formula the law provides. You do not have the rights or the opportunity to change it. The law says A times B times C over 365. Somebody will argue and say, but well, in the year 2020, 2020 was a leap year, so we had 366 days instead. So I'm going to do mine c over 366 no you have you don't have the right what the lord did really said or what the lord did was it said it's a times b times c over 365 the law is using 365 for a reason and it is not up to you to massage the figure to suit what you want to do let me explain the components because a lot of people get the meaning of c wrong i'll explain it right now a is very simple a is the depreciation basis of the pool of depreciable assets at the end of the basis period. I'll explain depreciable basis very soon and um, depreciation ba basis very soon. For those who want to quickly remember, if you're an accountant, just see this as carrying value at the end of the year. For now, if you're not an accountant, I'll explain to so just relax. So A is the depreciation basis of the pool of depreciable assets at the end of the basis period. B is the depreciation rate applicable to the pool. So the table I showed you, if it's class 1 assets or class 1 pool, you use 40%. If it's class 2, you use 30%. If it's class 3, you use 20%. If it's class 4, you use 10%. And if it's class 5, 1 over useful life or cost of assets over useful life. Remember this. C, listen carefully. C represents the number of days in the basis period of the person. C represents the number of days in the basis period of the person. So when it comes to C, 
there are some who actually think c means the number of days or the number of months or the period you actually owned the asset no it's the number of days in the basis period of the person in essence what it means is that c will only matter in the year of commencement of business and in the year of cessation of business because it's only in the year of commencement in the case where let's say the company does not commence on the first day of the year let's assume that a company has a, a first january to 31st december um, accounting year so it means their basis period will be first january to 31st december if the company commences operations on any other day other than first january then they will have a basis period not up to the full 365 days so c will be used to apportion this accordingly on the other hand if you have a company that ceases business within the basis period and let's say let's assume they have a 31st december year end and they don't cease business on the last day of the year then the c will also represent the number of days they were in operation before they ended business take note c is not when you bought the asset so in the exam questions as i'll show you when we start doing questions on this you realize that the examiners will deliberately give you the date on which the asset was acquired to see if you will remember your accounting rules and use the number of days you've owned the asset but remember the law is fixed and says see the number of days in the basis period so for a company that has the question doesn't tell you it started business this year or it commenced operations this year or it ceased business this year your C will be 365 it will be times 365 by 365 that will give you one right so you just multiply the depreciation basis times the rate and you have your answer remember this very carefully another thing that some students also do or have been taught to do is to use months to prorate i mean the number of months so some do a times b times c over 12 where their c will be number of months remember that the law uses number of days it is not up to you to use months there are some people who argue and say in an exam where you are hard pressed for time and you cannot count days because you know you have to sometimes count your fingers uh, to determine the number of days in a particular month so the question can tell you the company commenced operations on 14th february and then the year end is somewhere so you probably have to count your fingers to get the days in february before you start doing plus 31 plus 30 you start reciting um 30 days of um, november is that how to say it april 30 days of september april june and november that thing you say that and then you use that to determine the number of days in a month add them together some people use months as a quick fix but remember that your answer will be different from the guy who uses days the answer may not be too different then there might be some small variance which might not matter but please you do what the law says you should do the c is number of days in the basis period not months and is divided by 365. now that we know this let's look at something that i call the 500 series limit rule it says that where at the end of a year of assessment the depreciation basis or we can call let's even call it the closing balance of the pool I'll use more tax specific terms when we get there very soon. So let's just say at the end of the year of assessment, if the balance on the pool, after you've taken away capital allowance for the year, gives you a figure that is less than 500 Ghana CDs, we grant you an extra capital allowance equal to that amount for the pool to become zero. It means we dissolve pools that are not greater than 500 CDs. What does this mean? If for the year, let's say your class one pool, you sold a number of your computers during the year, and then the balance on the pool is 490 CDs, 490. This 490 was arrived at after you've already deducted capital allowance for the year. The law is saying that you know what? The balance is less than 500. So I'm giving you an extra deduction. So take take the whole balance and then arrive at your capital allowance for the year so that will reduce the entire pool to zero what it means is we don't hold pool balances that are less than 500 when you do your computation and you see any pool balance that is less than 500 you need to give an extra capital allowance add that balance less than 500 
to the capital allowance for the year and reduce the whole pool to zero. So now that we know the 500 CDs rule, we can take a break here and we'll continue capital allowances in the next session. So as usual, if you love this, smash the like button and don't forget to share this video within your network. I'll catch you shortly. Thank you.